Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hello, I'm Michael North. Uh, welcome to another episode of Understanding China. In this program, we try to portray ideas and images uh, from China in a way that people outside of China will understand it. And we try to portray China from the inside out. And we rely a lot on the generosity of highly qualified professionals, both in America and China, to help explain the mysteries of how America and China fit together and how they don't. And one of the people that we're really honored to work with is uh, Cindy Ning. And Cindy, I don't want to embarrass you, but you're probably one of the leading teachers of Chinese in America, active. You're, you head the Confucius Institute at University of Hawaii, and you've written textbooks, and you've been head of teachers associations in this area. So um, I'd, I'd like to proclaim you as one of the, one of the top <laughs> practicing experts in, in Chinese uh, in America. And how did you get into that field? Uh... Probably because I didn't know Chinese. <laughs> My parents are from China, but I was born and raised in Pakistan. And I was the only one in my family, one of four children, who was born and raised in Pakistan. So I always felt that everybody else had something that I didn't. Uh -huh. They had a connection to China, and I didn't know what China was, except uh -huh. through the stories of my, my except parents. Except there it is on your face. <laughs> yes. Right? And, yes. Well, I didn't discover your, that until bones. I was about seven or eight years old, until I looked at myself in the mirror and thought, yeah, yes. I, I am different than other people. Yeah. But anyway, it was that. That, that 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 lack that um, something that everybody else had that I didn't have that drove me to I've got to find out what it is and yeah. so I basically spent my whole life trying to find out what it was that everybody else in my family had that I didn't and you found yourself in Michigan and you went <laughs> to school there and got a degree there yes uh -huh. how, how did that happen how did your whole family get into Michigan my no well no my family ended up in Rochester New York Rochester. when my sister was working um, uh, she at, at the time, and my parents ended up uh, working for um, University of Rochester Strong Memorial Hospital. Um, but uh, I had a I had a cousin who uh, was had been teaching at Western Michigan University, and I was trying to go to a small liberal arts college, mm -hmm. and he told me about Kalamazoo College nearby, in the same town as mm -hmm. Western Michigan University. So I applied, and um, they accepted me, but I didn't, have a, I didn't have a scholarship package. And I realize now how much it cost, and I don't understand how my parents could, could have afforded <laughs> to send me there. But one of the things they offered to have me do was teach Chinese. Uh -huh. And um, so I, it was only to a couple students at a time. They, so you had an aptitude for teaching Chinese. <laughs> so basically, I, I, I said, well, uh, let me take a look at your textbook. And I read the textbook cover to cover, and I thought, hmm, uh, I have a feeling for what this language uh -huh. is like. And so that's how I got sucked in. And then University of Michigan used to send faculty down to test the students I was tutoring to give them a grade for the right. semester. So then University of Michigan recruited me for their, for their program. So you're involved in establishing standards and textbooks and tests and so on to right. make sure that people know what they've learned and right. and that's a lot of your job at University of Hawaii you work a lot with of course um, students at the university but there's youth programs as well where we bring people from China to America and you're teaching uh, mm -hmm. both languages to two different groups of students. It's More really Chinese to Americans than, than English to people from China, although uh -huh. if, if we did bring people in from China, we, I would make use of the uh, rich resources of the Department of Second Language Studies uh -huh. upstairs, which is one of the best in the world um, at teaching foreign language. and um, they would. Well, we have a video uh -huh. of, of UH. Can we roll that video? And Cindy, you can describe what, what people are seeing as it's playing. OK. This is a drone shot of the uh, Manoa campus of the University of Hawaii. Um, looking towards Waikiki, there is the Center for Korean Studies, hmm. um, funded with 
money from the Korean government, and right across the street is Moore Hall. Mm -hmm. And Moore Hall is the language and linguistics building, and that those people running, and these people are a an annual summer camp and teacher training institute we've had for, I think this is a 12th year now, with funding from the U.S. government. Um, so the camp goes all day long, and um, uh, it begins at 9 o'clock in the morning, ends at 5 in the afternoon, and they are immersed in learning Chinese language. But since Chinese language is, is set in culture, they have to um, learn a lot about Chinese culture, too. So uh, our approach is to do things very hands-on. Uh, they don't uh, sit and read. They, they, they sing. They, they do exercises. They do projects. They mm. make presentations. Tell they figure out figure out things. Right. Uh, they practice calligraphy. They tell um, jokes. They try. Yeah. Um, Eat. <laughs> they, this is a tofu <laughs> unit. And uh, yeah. Um, and the kids uh, we used to be from all over the country. Now we're, we're trying to uh, open it only to kids from Hawaii. But the teachers, there's almost a one-on-one -on -one ratio of teachers to students. The teachers come from all over the country. And the teachers are here uh, practicing different approaches to language teaching. And that's them saying goodbye to us. Um, so it's going to happen again this coming summer, month of July. Your... That's beautiful. <laughs> that looks like a really fun program. It, it is a fun program. It, it lasts three weeks for the students and a, a three and a half weeks for the teachers. Yeah. Okay, I want you to give me a short lesson. A short lesson in Chinese? Yeah. Do you, just do a few, you... Just pretend that I don't know anything and you'll be almost completely right. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but there's uh -huh. some key words, uh -huh. some key expressions that anyone who's say a business person or somebody who's welcoming someone from China here uh -huh. would need to know. So how do I say hello? Ni hao. Ni hao. Ni hao. So it's uh -huh. ni hao. Uh -huh. And the inflection is very important, right? Uh -huh. I can't say ni hao. No, that'll no. be completely. <laughs> I can't say ni hao. Uh -huh. Because that'll mean something different, right? It, um, so you, you, try, you should try your best to get the inflection right. But if you don't get it right, um, it's not as dire as if you say ni hao, everybody's going to know right. what, what you mean, right. even if you get the tones a little so wrong. So how do it, I say, how are you today? Ni jin tian hao ma? 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 <laughs> yeah, and these tones, you know, they kind of exist in English too, right? Uh -huh. uh, it's not, it's not as, as, as impossible as people sometimes think. Mm. For example, if I, if I were to say, um, yes, versus if I were to say, yes, uh -huh. is there a difference? Yes, big difference. Yes. Those are two of the four tones. Right. There's four tones in Chinese. Those are two. Uh, yes versus yes. So yes is dui. Yes Sometimes. is um, how. Yeah, dui. How is the third tone. So there's four tones. Right. Uh, yes is tone four. Yes is tone two. And then tone one is high level, which is what you do when you when you like are playing hide and seek and you go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, nine, nine, nine. ready or not, here I come. No, 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 no. That's first tone. <laughs> okay. Well, so what are the three forms of yes that you can say yes? in Chinese? You can say yes, yes. Uh, but in Chinese. You know, of yes? Oh, no. You don't, there isn't a, a direct equivalent of yes in Chinese. You repeat the <laughs> verb. You repeat the verb. So okay. if the verb is like, you uh -huh. say like. If uh -huh. the verb is go, you say go. That's yes. Uh -huh. If you if you the verb is are, are you American? You say you're, to say yes. You say are, am, the, and the uh -huh. and the verb and the verbs don't decline. Isn't that simple? I am, you are. It's all sure. Right. In Chinese. And there's no future, no past tense. Well, there's ways of uh, in right. indicating that, but yes. not by declining the verb. Right. <laughs> so, so so grammar in Chinese is much simpler than grammar in many other languages. How do I say goodbye? 再见. See you again. Zai jian. Okay. Which is four four, yeah? So falling, falling. Like okay. yes, yes, zai jian. Zai jian. How do you say I like you? Wa xi huan ni and be careful with that. That's as that's as 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 intense as you want to go uh -huh. with, with, with Chinese it, 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 to express that. Uh, that's as much as you want to say. Okay. And you don't want to say that to everybody. Right. <laughs> yes. 
So, 我喜欢你。我喜欢 It's easy. It's perfectly fine to say 我喜欢 this and 我喜欢 that. That's fine.、Uh, But if you want to say directly to somebody else, 我喜欢你 That's that's a little touchy. So a little personal. Yes,、yeah, a little personal. So there's a cultural message、yes. in there, right? Definitely. Because there's a great reserve in the Chinese personality.、Um, everything is changing. Um, and China is very diverse, and young people in certain situations might, find, might might act much more like American young people. But generally, it wouldn't hurt to、uh, to to think that、um, yeah. be careful.、Yeah. Uh, you know, you how do you wanna... say China in Chinese? Zhongguo, Zhongguo. Yeah,、okay. the Middle Kingdom, the the Middle. Kingdom and America is Mei Guo, the beautiful kingdom. Oh, and <laughs> how do you say Hawaii? Xia Wei. That is、um, transliteration.、Uh, it says it's it's Xia Wei in Mandarin because originally it was Hawaii in、mm. Cantonese, which sounds a lot more like Hawaii. Yes. But the characters for Hawaii. Is Xia Wei? Well, well、uh. no, it's the same characters,、mm. but it's pronounced Xia Wei, which、oh. which is a little, little more distanced、uh, from the sound、okay. of Hawaii. <laughs> so interesting. How do you say I'm hungry? 我饿了。Oh. <laughs> Sounds、oh. like you're rolling、oh. marbles. Yeah, around in just your pretending, mouth. pretend so, that you know you, you, somebody's punched your stomach. Break, break it down、uh -huh. for us very carefully. There's there's three sounds there. Wah, 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 I. Right. Wah, yeah. Wah, I. Yes. Uh, to uh. be hungry. Uh. Okay.、Yeah. And le is a little particle that goes on the end after a verb to to indicate that this is something different. I wasn't hungry before. Now I am. Oh. Oh. So now I've become、oh. hungry, and the, these little grammatical markers、uh, right. happen all over the place. And they so, they stand in place of a verb. There may not in, be a verb really in that expression. Well, they stand in place of declining the verb. Uh huh.、Um, in in、uh, in English, you could say I am hungry. I was hungry. I am now hungry. You know, the verb. It, it's、right. is these things that change. But in Chinese, this. Other ways of indicating the same thing. Right. Le is one of those ways. How do you say I'm full? 我饱了 So,、um, 饱 is to be full, and le again is that the change. So、right? the only difference you start with 我 I, 我 you、uh -huh. end with le,、uh -huh. and there's a 饱 in、yeah. the middle. Yes. I'm full. Yeah. You can、uh. say 我病了 I'm sick. I've gotten sick.、Oh. 我病了我好了 I've、yeah. gotten better. Right. <laughs> Chinese people always say to me, "Our language is so simple; you can learn it overnight."、Uh, I'll give you a very simple、uh, example. In, like in a Chinese class, you can teach the numbers one to ten thousand in a day,、oh. and and you can't do that in all languages. But Chinese is so so organized. Actually,、yeah. you know, in in the summer start off camp, we use、um, an abacus.、Um, we ha we have students work on abacuses、um, to reinforce math concepts because、um, Chinese is so logical and so organized.、Mm -hmm. you, you know, the numbers one to ten, and then it's ten one, ten two, ten three, and then it's two ten one, two ten two, two ten three,、yeah. three ten one, two ten two, three, three ten three. You know, it it just repeats. Right. Uh, ad, ad infinitum. So if you know the numbers one to ten, basically you can count as、to、high、forever. as you want to go、right. with certain numbers for the for certain terms for the really high numbers. I find this fascinating because、mm. I, I think you really can get some insight into the country and the people, the history and the culture if you're listening carefully to the language. And yeah,、um, that's. We're going to take a break on that. Note, and we'll come back and pick it up from there. Do you want to be cool like me? If so, watch my show on Tuesdays at one called Out of the Comfort Zone. I sang this song to you because I think you either are cool or have the potential to be seriously cool. And I want you to come watch my show, where I bring in experts who talk all about easy strategies to be healthier, happier, build better relationships, and make your life a success. So come sit with the cool kids at Out of the Comfort Zone on Tuesdays at one. See you there.
Hey, how come he gets to go in? He's a service dog. Well, I could get a vest too. You're not even a service dog. He's trained to assist his owner. Well, I can do whatever he can do. Wow, did he just open the door? Yep. Oh, I can't do that. I can't do that either. He's trained for over two years to become a service dog. Man, I wish I could be a service dog. So we're back with Cindy Ning here, and we're in the middle of our Chinese lesson. <laughs> so uh, let's get back to it here. Cindy. Okay. Um, the written form of Chinese is, of course, pictorial. There's no, mm. there's no letters. There's no A B right. C D E. Right. In That's China. it's con it's controversial to call it pictorial though because um, at the root there are images. There are Im well okay. Uh, the the letters are also I mean the Western letters are also images. In the thing way. about Chinese characters is that a very small subset of them derive from uh, direct pictographic uh, the natural world. Yeah, yeah, depiction. But most of them are. Uh, put together. There's a sound right. component, there's a meaning component. Right. So more than 85% of them are that. And some people have argued that um, Chinese is as, as uh, sound-based as any other. It's mm. just not entirely sound-based, like, you know, right. letter, uh, an alphabet. Well, an take, alphabet. The, take the word China, for mm -hmm. example. What, how do you write the word China? Right. And explain to us what that what that shape and that right you you can see the the word for middle zhong is one of the ones that derived uh, pictorially uh -huh. um, so you have a block uh -huh. and you have a line that goes th directly through the middle of it uh -huh. and that says middle right right so um, and then the word for guo in the um, there's two forms of written Chinese now. There's the simplified form that uh, mainland China uses, and there's the traditional form that Taiwan, Hong Kong, a lot of um, uh, Chinese communities in the diaspora use. Yeah. And the original traditional form, um, you know, there was a an enclosure. Mm -hmm. So country, there's right. an enclosure, right. and inside the, the, that enclosure is me holding a spear. Ah. <laughs> it's okay. like I'm, the, you know, <laughs> this the space that, so that I'm that defending. So just that character is kind of a history lesson <laughs> right. in itself. Of China. Um, it's it, it, written Chinese is very interesting. There's people who say, who wish that uh, Chinese characters would just go away. Let's oh. just move to an alphabetic oh, system. No. And then the, uh, there's another whole group of people who say that oh, it's all about characters. It's yeah. all about characters. The reason I why just, I want to learn. Just the science of calligraphy itself uh -huh. is an art form. Yeah. You know, sure. you would never, you would very rarely see just a word. Uh -huh. put up in an art gallery, you know, like alphabet, <laughs> as a, and, and uh -huh. present that as uh -huh. a piece of art. But uh -huh. you very often see a poem or a series, a, a thought mm -hmm. expressed very gracefully in Chinese calligraphy. And I think that one of the reasons why um, a lot of the Chinese population would be rather reluctant to give up Chinese characters is that it's so much of the lived experience. Yeah. Um, and some people would argue that it helps form the Chinese character. Yeah. Um, the people who want characters to go away is like, why put in all the effort to, yeah. to learn the 5,000, 10,000 characters that yeah. you need to, um, to, to communicate? But, um, but there's some a certain people, richness. Some that. people say that you know it, it's putting in the 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 training, the discipline yeah, at right. a very early age without really knowing what the reward is going to be, just right. doing it, right. and then all of a sudden after you've accumulated a lot of it skill, know-how, all of a sudden it's like this is beautiful. Yeah. I can communicate. I understand right. the beauty of it. I can connect five thousand years backwards yeah. to to right. to my ancestors. I connect, you know. Horizontally to to to, to all these people. That's a very powerful message there. And yes. um, and some some people who say no, we'll never ch characters is the Chinese culture. We'll, we'll never drop it. Is is that we want to train our people to be disciplined like that? Right. To to put off delayed gratification. Right. To work really hard. Um, yeah. To trust other people who tell you right. this is the way to do it. Okay, it I'll just do it, together. and it'll all just trust me. It'll all come together later. Well, now we're, <laughs> let's take it to another level here, Cindy. Okay. We have another short video okay. um, from a friend, Lawrence Brom, and he's talking about Chinese culture. 
Can we roll that video now and then we'll talk about it afterwards? The Chinese culture is incredibly rich. But what's very important to understand about China's culture is over its 5,000 years of evolution, it has been the recipient of many different cultures. So we talk about Buddhism in China, it came in from India. We talk about many aspects of art and architecture. A lot of that was Arab influenced because China throughout the period of way before the Tang Dynasty, we had the Silk Road system. Effectively, the Silk Road was the economic order of the day for well over a thousand years. And if we think about that, that was only temporarily disrupted by colonialism and the neo-colonial period. And so the interaction of China with other cultures has always been very, very, very rich. And when we look at Chinese culture today, it is an amalgamation, it is a fusion of many different cultural inputs that have become Chinese. So in this case, I think what's really important is to recognize the value of this. And so when we think about this also, why are Chinese so fast advancing on technology, on AI, and on space? If you look at the history and you look at the culture and you look at the way of perceiving the world from the I Ching, which is one of the oldest written scriptures in the world, it's it is all about non-duality, it's all about the combination of yin and yang, it's all about people and nature and universality. These ideas are cutting edge in the West right now. No wonder they're advancing so quickly on AI, because it's about that philosophical root. That wisdom, that knowledge is in the DNA. It's something that was programmed in centuries and centuries and centuries ago. It's not coming from YouTube, it's not coming from Twitter, it's not coming from Facebook, it's not coming from any of those things. And so I think it's really important to re-recognize the value of China's culture and to call for an Asian set of values. We're talking about environmental protection, we're talking about eliminating gaps between rich and poor, we're talking about trying to create harmonious society, about preventing conflict rather than dealing with it after it's happened. These are core concepts which are part of an Asian philosophy. And as soon as we start to talk about that as something that's a shared philosophy across the Asian region, then we have to start thinking about what is universal, you know, recognized human rights, what are universal recognized values. Those are rights for everybody to have clean water, clean air, to be able to have sustainable income, to be able to have a future. These are things that are a broader matrix. Okay, Lawrence is talking a little bit about the inherent uh, creativity of, of, uh, of Chinese people based on their culture. Maybe you can reflect on that mm. a little bit with us. It's very, very interesting, very thought-provoking. I have no facile comments uh, to make. Um, it's, it's sort of um, ironic. I, I guess the, the, the Chinese b belief always has been, I think, when a child is young, you, you train them sort of rote, rote hmm. memory uh, fashion. Um, when the child is young, it's too early for them to be creative. You 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 pack all this stuff, all the all the everything that's come down to us Memorize from uh, from from the past and from from contemporary um, civilization. Right. You take it and 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 and just regurgitate it. But then there comes a point where that stops, mm -hmm. and you you sort of take a stand and you think, okay, who am who am I and what am I going to do now? And mm -hmm. then. I guess that's the point at which your creativity, right. if you have it, right. would um, would make use of everything else that's already in your head. People who um, are against that say that you know in the formative years students are stifled 
by all this right. information that just pours in on them. And, and they also yeah. say Chinese people can't be creative. They right. can't, can't create anything new. Right. They can only remember right. other things. <laughs> and that's, right. that's really not true, especially among young people now that I've found. They're as creative as young people you find anywhere in America or Europe. And the wellspring of their creativity is, is a little different because of the history and their culture. Um, my most recent trip to China, they were very proud of the four new um, major, major inventions. Um, the, the, the Wei, Wei Xing, the WeChat, yes. that, uh -huh. that is used ubiquitously. Yes. And the people don't need cash anymore. You know, yes. a, a vendor selling goods yeah. on the ground will have a uh, QR code that you, meter, yeah. that you pay with. And, yeah. and China feels that, that it has sort of taken the lead in the shared bikes, yes. the shared transportation, right. Biki bike um, yeah. ex experience, and anyway, internet so bike. yeah, internet yeah. internet biking and and yeah. what was the fourth one? Um, <laughs> Those are three really good ones, yeah. though, and they show a great amount of creativity. Um, Wei Xin is far superior to Facebook, for example, mm. in its utility and the type of tools and the style of interaction that you can fashion. I find it much easier to use than Facebook, uh -huh. uh, much more powerful. It's um, becoming a little challenging if you're not up, up with that technology to get along in China because it used to be that I could like hail a cab yeah. on the street in China. Well, now everybody, yeah. you know, now you, have to tap in. <laughs> yeah, you tap in and a, and, a, and a car arrives, and you don't, if you ha don't have that, you can't yeah. do it. So. Cindy, uh -huh. we're going to have to pick this up next time. I, I really think there should be a next time, and we can go to the next level. So I want to thank you for your attention on this episode of Understanding China, and look forward to seeing you again soon.